This morning, we continue to look at a biblical theological approach to the Holy Spirit. We're going through the Scripture in its canonical order, and we're looking to see the data of Scripture, what's actually in there about the Holy Spirit, and what can we learn from this. Now, last week, uh, we were studying the Old Testament, and uh, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and in Hebrew, we learned the word ruach. And yeah, you have to, very nice. Uh, the word ruach means spirit. Could be the human spirit. The Holy Spirit means spirit. Also means wind or breath. Well, this week we're studying the New Testament, and the New Testament is written in Greek. And the word here is pnevma. And pnevma, surprisingly enough, means spirit or wind or breath is basically the same exact concept as ruach. So, as we study the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, we have that same basic underlying vocabulary. And as I said, we're going to go in canonical order. So if you want to open your Bibles, you can follow along with me. We're also going to use uh, the Logos Bible Study software. So we'll have the text up here on the screen as well. Some of the texts are longer, so you might want to actually go and be able to move back and forth at your own pace within them. We begin in Matthew with the birth of Jesus. And as we look at verse 18, what do you learn from this about the Holy Spirit? Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Any thoughts about the Holy Spirit from this text? An announcer speaks for God. Well, I don't know. That's kind of silly. Speaks for God. <laughs> no, no, you're. Speaks for. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit makes information known to us. Good. The Holy Spirit acts physically in the world. The Holy Spirit is active in the world. That's a really good insight. The Holy Spirit is the giver of life. Didn't we see that last week as we were in Genesis? And we saw that God breathed the Ruach into Adam, into Mr. Dirt, and he became a living being. So yeah, the Holy Spirit is the giver of life. It's good stuff. We also have here the idea, and we see this in the Gospel of Luke, where we have the virgin conception. It says there that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. When we think of overshadowing, that's also an Old Testament image. Think back to Genesis 1-2. What happens in Genesis 1-2? The Spirit hovers over. The Spirit hovers over the deeps in creation. The Holy Spirit remains. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and remains. It hovers over her. So we have the Holy Spirit in, active in these ways. In Matthew, we now jump forward. And we have uh, Jesus being baptized. Back to the overshadows, what's the kind of image that we're supposed to get from that? Overshadows. We have the Holy Spirit hovering. So we're going to see the exact. Let me hold. Let me hold off on that just for a second, because it'll be relevant in a minute as we continue to look at the baptism of Jesus. So here we have John appearing in the wilderness, and he's bringing forth the word of Isaiah, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and to the point of the Holy Spirit being an announcer. Speaking by the Holy Spirit, the prophet says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. We then have Jesus coming to be baptized by John. And in verse 16, notice what happens. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, look, the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest upon him. 
And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So as we look at this text, what do we learn about the Holy Spirit? How do we see the data of Scripture presenting the Spirit to us? Almost like an affirmation, an affirming of how the Father is feeling, if you Again, will. Well, how the Father's feeling, but also commending to us the Son. Mm -hmm. The Spirit is glorifying the Son. That's a better word. Yeah, definitely. We see fulfillment of prophecy here as well. Last week, we read from Isaiah 64 about the work of the Holy Spirit. In praying in the Spirit, Isaiah says, Oh, that you would come down, that you would rend the heavens and come down and the mountains would shake with your presence. Well, back in Ezekiel 10, the Lord's presence had left. What's happening here? Matthew tells us, and Mark is even clearer, because Mark says that the heavens are torn open when Jesus is baptized. Mark goes directly to Isaiah. The heavens are torn open as the Lord's divine presence returns to his people both in the person of Emmanuel, who was born 30 years earlier, but also the Spirit arrives here. The divine presence. How does the Spirit arrive? What do we learn from that? In stained glass windows, in iconography, this scene is often used for the portrayal of the Holy Spirit. Dove. Yeah, as a dove. They, they put a dove in the stained glass window. I got a question for you. Did the Holy Spirit actually come as a dove that flies down and lands on Jesus' head? We don't know. No. It's, it's as, like, it's a simile. So what, what is happening here? When a dove, Let's contrast for a second. Contrast a dove versus an eagle. Eagles come swooping down at 100 miles an hour out of the sky and bam, they get a fish out of the water and fly away. It's an amazing sight. Doves flutter down gently and they land and they remain. What kind of an image do you see happening here? What texts that we've read last week and this week come to mind as you see Jesus being baptized in the Holy Spirit's presence? Well, that of um, Pentecost when the Spirit, you know, indwells, it remains, comes, settles, the idea of, the idea of remaining. Yeah, you're, you're jumping forward, you're exactly right. Okay. <laughs> Looking... Mother Hen, you, you know, he wants to come around and guard and, and gather his people in. Absolutely, yes. The Holy Spirit is, is that like this Mother Hen brooding, gathering, protecting, hovering, remaining. We had it in Genesis 1 2. We've seen it again and again. We saw it with Mary at the conception. We see it now here as the Holy Spirit descends and remains upon Jesus. Very much. That's good insight. It also, you point out something that we're going to see later. The Holy Spirit acts according to the divine will. The Holy Spirit acts as the Holy Spirit chooses, not as we would choose the Holy Spirit to act. So, yeah. You know, in the Old Testament, the worst case scenario is the Spirit leaving. Think of David in Psalm 51. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Ezekiel 10, the Spirit departs, gets on the chariot, flies away, never to return, well, until now. 
the worst case scenario is the Spirit departing. Here in the New Testament, we see again and again the Spirit returning and remaining. So after that, next up, we see that the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Observations. Wow, you're right. And, and I absolutely, with you, also very much pray, lead me not into temptation. Um, I'm not Jesus. Uh, he, unlike Adam, and unlike everybody since Adam, is able to obediently say, get thee away from me, Satan. It is written, he follows the Lord. He follows his Father's will. Notice what it says here. That first response to Jesus to Satan, as Satan's trying to tempt him, he says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says this in the context of a long period of, of temptation and deprivation and hardship in the desert, in the wilderness. And hunger. And hunger. And Wendy took us, therefore, to the Lord's Prayer, where we pray, give us today our daily bread. Oh, and yeah, by the way, in the same context, today, please, don't lead me into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Jesus, on our behalf, faces down the evil one. Here in the desert, Jesus shows us that when we're in the wilderness, whether it's a physical wilderness or a spiritual wilderness, we need God's daily provision. We need the Holy Spirit's remaining with us if we're going to get through. So again, as we saw in verse 3, that, or chapter 3 rather, that, that remaining of the Holy Spirit is really, really important. I'm going to jump forward now to uh, Matthew 10. And here we have um, Jesus sending out the disciples. And he says that you're going out like sheep in the midst of wolves. He says to beware of men, that they will deliver you over. Verse 19, when they deliver you over, don't be anxious. What you need to say will be given to you in that hour. It's not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So as we look at this text and we think about the Holy Spirit, what is the scripture teaching us about the spirit, about us, about the relationship? What do we learn here? Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit will empower us. And interestingly enough, in the same way that just six chapters ago, the Holy Spirit was with Jesus and empowered Jesus, the Holy Spirit will also empower us and give us the words to say. Excellent. Yeah, what else? Well, it also, in verse 19, it specifically says, do not be anxious how you are to speak. So again, the idea of the Spirit comforting you, and you, you need not worry about mm -hmm. situations that you have no control over. Yeah, we, we receive comfort. Later, it's going to be very explicit. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. But here we see the Holy Spirit brings us comfort, so we don't need to worry. Because he's there, he's remaining, he's providing for us. Good. Notice in verse 19 that what you need to say will be given to you years in advance. Actually, no, the text says in that hour. Um, the modern concept of, of just-in-time supply chain um, is actually an a innovation of the Holy Spirit some 2,000 years ago. Um, the Holy Spirit will give us what we need when we need it. And that's comforting, too, that we can trust in the Holy Spirit's provision at just the right time. We jump forward now to Matthew 12. And uh, in verse 22, we have a demon-possessed man showing up in the synagogue, and uh, Jesus heals him. And the Pharisees are just saying, oh my goodness, he's healing, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan. 
Jesus responds to the Pharisees and says, uh, well, if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's not by the power of demons, but it's by the Spirit that Jesus casts out demons. So one of the works of the Holy Spirit is Yeah, to cast out, to defeat demonic power, to destroy it, to render it impotent, to rescue God's people. We also see in this text, uh, we get on to verse 31. What does Jesus say in this verse? Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. What's our takeaway here? Theologically speaking. It's like the ultimate rejection of God, of the triune God. Yeah. Attributing the work of God to Satan is effectively the ultimate rejection of God's work. Which, in saying that, Danny also points out that what the text is telling us here is very clear. Who, who do you blaspheme against? Do you blaspheme against your mom? Or against the president? You only can blaspheme against God. So if you can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, what's the text telling us? Yeah. The Holy Spirit is God. And that's made even more clear by the fact that Jesus, when he issues his great commission, what does he tell the disciples? Well, even going back to the mm -hmm. last one, it, it also has overtones of the Holy Spirit sealing your salvation, because we were talking about losing what you know, mm -hmm. your salvation. Right? Sealing your salvation, which then is, that's also, isn't that the idea of remaining? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit's remaining again. Yeah. Could you go back to that? I'd be happy to. It says that whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. So does that seem to contradict what we just said? That when we speak, we speak against, we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, not forgiven. Blaspheme the Son of Man, forgiven. So the, the context here is that they're complaining that his, his works, which Jesus said a few verses ago, he was doing by the Spirit. They're saying that these works are the work of Satan. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. If you say the work of God is really the work of Satan, you, you've blown it. Because you're, how is it we're saved? We're saved by throwing ourselves upon God's work, by trusting in what God has done through Christ, does in me through the Holy Spirit. We're trusting in the triune God's work. Now, if you're saying that the triune God's work is really the work of Satan, what are you doing? You're trusting in Satan. You're a tri I mean, it, it, it doesn't work. I think that's what I mean. I, I don't think that it's attempting to set up any sort of a, a hierarchy of, well, it's okay to say a bad word about Jesus, but it's not okay to say a bad word about the Holy Spirit. Because if you go back to, take, go back to the idea of the Ten Commandments, and thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord, thy God, in vain. When we were kids in school, we were taught that meant you're not allowed to say a certain phrase. That's just the tip of the iceberg. What it really means is you shall not lift up the name of Adonai as though it was garbage. Which is to say, don't live claiming you're his as if you're not. Don't treat his name as if it was worthless. In all that you say and in all that you do and all that you are, raise up his holy name. Exalt it. Same thing's true here. When we blaspheme, we're lifting up the name as if it was junk, filth, garbage. Princess Bride, yes. Sorry. So that whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man what do you think that's referring to? So, well, th let's think about it for a second. There are lots of people who speak words against the Son of Man as he's right there. A bunch of those people 
on the day of Pentecost are going to be hanging out in the streets and they're going to hear Peter preach. And they're going to say, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter will say, be baptized, repent, and they're saved. Their blasphemy against the Son of Man during their lives, right there, is forgiven a couple years later on the streets of Jerusalem. Or perhaps in other circumstances throughout Judea, as they encounter the Word, and they repent and are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. I think that's what it's after. Divinity of the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to jump forward to Luke chapter 1. And so at the beginning of Luke chapter 1, before Jesus, before Mary, we have Zechariah, who is a priest who's serving God in the temple. He's burning incense before the Lord, and an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah. And the angel of the Lord appears, and Zechariah is troubled. Angels aren't like Raphael paintings. Uh, when angels appear, they always say to the people, whoa, relax, relax, don't be afraid, everything's fine. They're awesome figures. So the angel says to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So in this passage, the angel gives Zechariah a preview of some of the Holy Spirit's work. What does that advanced preview look like? What do we see of the Holy Spirit's work? Yeah. Zechariah's child, John, is going to be filled with the power of the Spirit. Um, I think you guys mentioned uh, back in the, old, in the Old Testament passage the Holy Spirit rushing on. Um, I, I perceive John as being someone who the Holy Spirit rushes upon. Uh, I mean, the guy's out there eating bugs and honey and wearing camel's hair and telling people that they're a brood of vipers. And I mean, what a powerful Old Testament prophet figure he is. I mean, Jesus says that there is no prophet greater than John. So, yeah, he's filled with the Spirit. But there's a purpose to it. Too. Yes, yes. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to turn the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So the Spirit is filling John with the purpose of turning people's hearts to God. Absolutely. So the Spirit will glorify the Father by turning people's hearts to the Father. But our God is triune. The Spirit also glorifies the Son. Later in John 16, 14, Jesus will tell the disciples, the Spirit will glorify me. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, the text says, no one can say Jesus is Lord. That is to say, nobody can exalt Jesus except in the Holy Spirit. So how is it that we're able to exalt Jesus? Power of the Holy Spirit. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. We then jump forward a little bit, and we have Luke's account of the virgin conception. As we talked about, the, most, the spirit of the Most High overshadows her. It's that idea of, of brooding, of remaining over, to envelop with a cloud. She is, she's covered, the spirit remains, she's protected in this work of the spirit. Jesus then is born. And we move forward to Luke chapter 2, and obediently, Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple to be dedicated as the law commands. And there's a man named Simeon in verse 25. He's righteous and devout. He's awaiting the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. 
It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And Simeon comes into the temple, and when Joseph and Mary bring the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, their obedient Jewish mom and dad, Simeon takes the baby in his arms and praises God. Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace. Why can he depart in peace? What's the Holy Spirit doing here? What do we learn about the Spirit from this tender scene from Jesus' infancy? Absolutely. Simeon has been waiting his whole life long for Messiah. And the Holy Spirit has given him comfort. Simeon, you won't die until you get to see it. You're right. It's, I hadn't even thought that's beautiful. Yes, again, we see the Holy Spirit as a comforter. He also is an, an announcer of good tidings. He tells Simeon what's coming. And when yet another mother, father, and baby come walking in, Heaven only knows how many thousands have come walking into the temple during the time Simeon's been waiting. The Holy Spirit tells Simeon, Psst, that one is an announcer. Paul. The Holy Spirit helps us to see. Just like when we uh, all of a sudden have a knowledge of the word where it makes sense in our minds, uh, God, <laughs> Holy Spirit caused him to see that child was uh, the promise. Oh yeah, very much so. He does the same thing for me and for you opening our eyes to the truth in the same way that he opened Simeon's eyes to the truth. Well, that's really great. Thank you. So we'll get there in a second, but to, to answer your question, you, so you're exactly right. The Holy Spirit, as we've seen all throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is active, very, very active. The Holy Spirit rushes on people. The Holy Spirit uh, empowers people, enables people, speaks to people, teaches people, leads people. But it's only after Jesus' resurrection that the Holy Spirit is given to us and dwells permanently within us and we become the dwelling place of Holy Spirit. We become the dwelling place of God. We become the temple. There's no need for building anymore. God's people are his temple. So yeah, it's after the resurrection when Jesus gives the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit arrives on Pentecost and we then have the inflowing of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And in a few minutes, when we get there, we're going to see it happening over and over and over again. It's, it's the big characteristic event of the entire book of Acts. I've heard people, I've heard people call it um, the gospel of the Holy Spirit. It, it didn't. I think it wants to go to sleep. No. No? No. I, I, I don't know why that okay. didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, being a buhis, I don't know. Um, so we have Simeon. Um, we jump forward. Uh, Luke chapter 4 recounts the exact same events that we read in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted in the desert. And after that happens, in Luke 4 verse 1, not 41, there's no Luke 41. In Luke 4 1 we read that Jesus, after being tempted by Satan returns. Scratch that. After he's baptized, being baptized, he's full of the Holy Spirit. He returns from the Jordan where he's baptized. He's then led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted. We've been through that. What I want to add now is after that, in verse 14, Jesus returns and begins his ministry. And we see that Jesus' ministry is filled with 
the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is empowering him to do the things that he does. That in and of itself is kind of an odd concept. Mm -hmm. One of the Trinity empowering the other, another person of the Trinity. True, but let's, let's think about Jesus for a second in his incarnation. What is it that Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 10? He says that not seeking to, to exploit his equality with God, Jesus empties himself, taking on the form of a servant and becoming obedient even unto death. So I think during his ministry, the Lord Jesus voluntarily lays aside the power that is rightfully his, taking on this fully human nature for us. And these powerful miracles that he does, he does in the spirit. That's, that's my belief, that's my interpretation, and I think that's, the, that's how I see the data of scripture here playing out. Jesus then, in verse 16, he comes to his hometown. He's back in Nazareth again. And he arrives at the synagogue and they recognize this rabbi and they hand him the Torah scroll and invite him to read the Torah portion for the day. He opens the scroll, it's the book of Isaiah, and he reads, the spirit of Adonai is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in this amazing, I think Danny called it a scroll drop moment, he closes the scroll and he says, the scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. So what do we learn about the spirit from, from this passage? Yeah, he brings the power to accomplish God's will. He, he leads Jesus. He had led Jesus into the wilderness. He now leads Jesus into the synagogue in Capernaum, or scratch that, Nazareth, on the very day when this is the assigned reading. Not the day before, not the day after. On this day, the Holy Spirit had inspired Isaiah to write this text, which we read last week. The Holy Spirit now leads Jesus to the place where this text is fulfilled. The triune God, remember back in week, module two, we talked about the doctrine of God. The three persons of the one God work together in all of their actions to accomplish their will. The Father and the Son and the Spirit work together to bring about your salvation, to respond to your prayers, whatever it may be in creation in Genesis 1. And John 1, we see all three persons active. It's almost like the Spirit is kind of like keeping everybody in line according to the timeline, you know? He's, mm. he's the agenda maker, you know? Okay, it's time for this, it's time for that. I'm going to, you know, he sent me to be prayed at this time. Yeah. The agenda keeper. Yeah, and again, you're right. It's that idea of leading, the Holy Spirit's leading. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at that, good news to the poor, liberty, sight to the blind, um, you think of the spirit as being a comforter, a teacher. There's a real uh, uh, nurturing field for me. Yeah. The rescuer. Yeah. Our help who shows up when there's no other possible help. Yeah, very much. And also, the, the motive, like, 
the motivator, you know, who, who allows you to go forth and speak when it's time to speak or understand when it's time to understand, you know, kind of mm -hmm. both of those. Mm -hmm. We need to keep moving. I'm going to jump forward. There's a lot more material, but I'm going to go to John because we need to give John his opportunity to speak to us. In John chapter 3, we have the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is one of the Pharisees. He comes to Jesus by night, and he's wanting to know how a person can be saved. And what is it that Jesus says? He says to him, truly, truly, by the way, this is amen, amen in Hebrew. Let it be done. Let it be done. Only Jesus says this. For hundreds of years, there have been no prophets. Nobody says, truly, I say to you. In fact, nobody even says, thus saith the Lord. Jesus is new authority, speaking by the authority and power of God. This is totally mind-boggling to the people. But anyway, he says, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we learn that new birth is only possible by the Spirit's agency. I mean, thanks to Adam and Eve's rebellion, what was it God said to them back in Genesis? On the day you eat of it, dying you shall die. The Hebrews has that sort of repetitiveness for emphasis. They didn't have bold italic font. We've been dead in our trespasses and sins ever since. We need to be born of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's agency that makes new life possible. And in this passage, we see an allusion back to Ezekiel 36. In Ezekiel 36, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. It's a priestly image of the priest being cleansed before being enter, able to enter into the Holy of Holies. He who is born of water has been sprinkled by the Spirit with clean water, purified and therefore able to enter the Holy of of holies. Better than that, to have the Holy of Holies, the Holy Spirit enter you. Ezekiel then continues, I will put my spirit within you. And that's exactly what Jesus says is going to happen now in the new covenant that he is establishing. Notice what it says in verse 8. Jesus says, I'm going to be Hebrew for a second, the Ruach blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Ruach. If you want to be Greek, you could say Pnephema. But as you look at that text, what's Jesus teaching us about the Holy Spirit in this passage? Thinking about Nicodemus's cluelessness as he approaches Jesus here, the teacher of Israel. Kind of gives me the idea that, you know, we don't know who has received the Spirit truly, who is only God the Father, or any man, mm -hmm. knows who is born of the Spirit. Sure. Um, and Jesus continues to get that image later on when he's like, Mm. I don't even know you. And I think the Holy Spirit graciously gives us assurance personally that, that I have been renewed. But you're right. I, I can't yeah, tell I about anybody right. else. Yeah. You can only tell about yourself by what the Holy Spirit's doing within you. They, God just so graciously gives us that assurance. But also notice that phrase the, the Ruach blows where it wishes. Uh, you don't get to tell the Holy Spirit what to do, my friend. All three persons of the triune God alone are infinitely free to do whatever their glorious divine will desires. The Holy Spirit is free to move as the Spirit wills to accomplish God's will. Later in 1 Corinthians 12, we'll see that the Holy Spirit gives gifts according to the Holy Spirit's own sovereign will. Let's go to John 6. What does that mean, Spirit, where it's in verse 8? He's saying something like, 
Mm-hmm. This is how the Spirit is. Mm-hmm. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So if we're born of the Spirit as Christians, what does that mean? How is that connected to, like, the way the Spirit moves uh, and, and exists? So it is with us. What does that mean? I think, so you don't know where the Spirit comes from or where it goes. You're not in control. You're not able to predict. You're not able to decide. God does this. The wind, the wind blows where it wills. You're not able, because Nicodemus, remember, says, oh, come on. Am I going to crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again when I'm old? Really? And the Lord is saying, no. This is a work of God. It is, you don't understand how it works yet. This is spoken at a point in time, but so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is a work of God. You don't yet understand it. Later on, by the way, we, we do understand it because the Lord goes to great lengths to explain to us through his later teaching and especially through the epistles how this thing works. I'm not sure that's entirely satisfying. It probably isn't, but is it at least? Okay. I think the construction of the sentence makes it seem like the person who is born of the Spirit will act like the Spirit, but that's not what the the sentence is saying. saying The effect of the Spirit is in this way on those who are born of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. You're connecting more. So... It is with everyone who is born of the Spirit to you must be born again, not as much to the wind blowing where it wishes. Those born of the Spirit don't act that way. It's their act that on that way. Yeah, thank you, Alfredo. Um, we're going to leap forward to John 6. And so what's happening here, so Jesus just fed 5,000 people. Then on the very next day, The multitude shows up, and they're hungry. And they follow him across the lake. And Jesus says to them, yeah, you came for bread, but I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me won't hunger. He says that whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. He says that, by the way, it is the Spirit who gives life. Your flesh is no help at all. These words that I speak to you are spirit and life. What what do we get from this text about, about the Holy Spirit's work? What kind of life is it that Jesus is talking about here? Yeah. We've already seen that the Spirit is the giver of life. That started back in Genesis. But here we see that our eternal life was lost because of original sin and continued because of my sin. But the Holy Spirit is the giver of eternal life through the work of Christ Jesus, who is the bread of life. As we go forward to John 14 through 16, you might want to go there. This passage here is Jesus' longest extended teaching about the Holy Spirit. In verse 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, again, there's that statement of divine authority. I tell you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and, really, greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. We have to look forward, verse 16 there. Jesus goes to the Father. He asks the Father. The Father sends the Holy Spirit to be with us. So why is it that the church is able to do greater works than Jesus? Because the Spirit 
because the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, obviously, he's not talking about salvation. I mean, nothing we can do can quite compare to the awesomeness of that. But, you know, he's talking about things like, you know, going around and, and doing miracles and feeding people and amazing miracles. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, for example, we freely give gifts and so forth. And so there's a hospital over in the Ukraine right now in a war zone ministering to wounded people in the name of Jesus Christ. As by the Holy Spirit, he works and does great things in the world. And why does he do this? Verse 13, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Again, the three persons of the triune God are always working together, collaborating to achieve their divine purpose, and they're always working to bring glory, one to another. You go forward to verse 25. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit, the helper, whom the Father will send in my mind, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. What do we learn from the Holy Spirit here? There's a lot of things that we're learning that we don't realize that we've actually that sit in our head. Well, maybe it's not in the head. Maybe the Holy Spirit in us all of a sudden brings it to mind. And um, it brings these things to mind. Which goes along with the, the timing, just at the right time. Something might be brought to mind. Mm -hmm. That you need comfort in the valley. Very good, yeah. The Holy Spirit's going to remind us of everything Jesus said. Some of those words are extremely comforting. Some of those words might be convicting at times when I need to be convicted. Some of those words might be words of proclamation, words of encouragement to others. He brings these words to our mind. I love it. Yeah, so many different ways. We need it all. We need it all. We need a helper. helper. Now, helper, we're not talking a, a servant here. That, that's not the notion in the Bible of help. In the Old Testament, the word help is used almost exclusively to refer to God. It is God who is the helper. When you can't help yourself, when all is lost, when you are lost, who's the helper? God. From who does my help come? My help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Holy Spirit is the helper, present among us, as we've read so repeatedly today, remaining among us as our help. I'm sorry, Paul? Our guide. He's our guide, our helper, our reminder, all of these things, absolutely. Is that the word azer? That is the word azer, yes, sir. But in the New Testament, it's... Uh, that's parkletos. Parkletos, one who is called alongside. It's a legal term. Uh, you're, you're being sent off to court. You need help. That helper's the parkletos. It's your counselor, your legal counsel. That's the parkletos. One, one who does what we can't do. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit will empower us to bear witness. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the unbelieving world of unrighteousness and sin and judgment. What's going on there? Without answering your question, to me that is um, one of the most... Uh, powerful things that the Holy Spirit does is conviction mm -hmm. in our lives. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Convicting of sin. Convicting is it's exposing to the light. Why does the Holy Spirit expose sin to the light? Because that's what separates us from God. Yes. And in hopes that we'll repent. The Lord does not 
rejoice in the death of the wicked. The Lord desires salvation. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin so that we'll recognize it because it's made clear and we're like, oh my goodness, I repent. It also reminds me of something that we talked about in our OAG in the Old Testament times. Coming near something unclean made you unclean. Here, it's exposing to the light. Something unclean coming near the clean does not defile the clean, but now the clean cleanses oh, the unclean. Yeah, and to that point, Convicting of righteousness. What's going on there? The Holy Spirit convicts the world, exposes to the world the righteousness of Jesus. It shows us that what's the answer to that unrighteousness that's been exposed in you? Well, the answer is the righteousness of Christ. Boom. They work together in a beautiful way to bring about salvation. I'm going to jump forward to Acts. In Acts 1.8, the Lord Jesus has already been raised from the dead. He's been with the disciples for a period of weeks, and it's now Ascension Day. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit brings power, but it brings power for a purpose. You will be my witnesses. The Greek word is martyr. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth work that the Holy Spirit is still busy empowering the church to do today. Jesus makes that promise. Lo and behold, not too many days later, is the day of Pentecost. It's one of the great feasts of the Jews. And all the disciples are together, and all of a sudden they hear the sound of a mighty rushing ruach. Yeah, I heard it. And it fills the entire house. And tongues of fire appear. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? That he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's happening here. Was tongues of fire appear. Mm -hmm. Was it really a rock or was it a moon? Well, they're a bunch of nice Jewish boys. <laughs> okay. So it was a ruach, but when they're writing it down for a bunch of Gentiles to read about, they, they, they wrote pneuma. Yes, oh. you're right. Just checking. <laughs> Just checking. So the Holy Spirit fills these guys. And what's intriguing is they all start speaking in languages they don't know. People are in Jerusalem from all over the diaspora, from all over the world. Jews have come in from all over the place, and there's a list of all the places they're from, and they're here to celebrate. And all of a sudden, in all of their own native languages, they hear these guys, these fishermen from Galilee. And come on, can anything good come from Nazareth? And they're speaking, wait a minute, they're speaking in my language. No, they're not, they're speaking in my language. No, they're not, they're speaking in my language. They're drunk. Peter says, no, no, they're not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. What's happening here? Peter says, the words of the prophet Joel have been fulfilled. We read this last week. One of the great expectations was that someday, the Lord would actually pour out his spirit. Not that it would just show up and then disappear, but it would be poured out upon and remain upon all flesh. Which, by the way, that's a Genesis 12, 3 thing. In your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's not just on all Jewish flesh. That's all flesh. And sure enough, the Holy Spirit shows up on Pentecost and fills thousands and thousands of people Jesus had promised that in the right hour, oh, he promised, by the way, you're going to be taken before councils and you're going to be beaten, and bad stuff will happen to you. But in the right time, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to speak. In Acts chapter 4, you see exactly that happening. The disciples are taken before the high priest, before the Sadducees, before the, uh, the Sanhedrin, rather, and the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit fills Peter. And Peter who just a couple weeks ago was cowering before a servant girl and didn't want to mention Jesus' name, he boldly stands up to the leaders of his nation and lets them have it, tells them all about Jesus. That's the power of the Spirit working in just a regular old guy, a fisherman who a few weeks ago was afraid to use the name of Jesus. 
We had this promise that the Holy Spirit would fall on all flesh. I'm going to jump forward. There's persecution in Judea, in Jerusalem. Some of the disciples scatter. A guy named Philip heads up to Samaria. The gospel is preached in Samaria. In where? What do you guys know about Samaria? That's where the dogs live. Oh, yes. <laughs> Samaria. <laughs> Get that out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, they were hated. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit here falls upon people in Samaria. This is astonishing. But, it, but it, it gets even weirder, guys. Who's maybe even worse than the Samaritans? If you're a first century Jew. Yes, the Romans, holy moly. So Peter, nice Jewish boy, is sitting and praying on the roof one day and he has a vision and God says, Peter, kill and eat. Nope, nope, nope. That's unclean, I'm not gonna do it. Over and over. God says to Peter, what I have made clean, you may not call unclean. He then tells, the Holy Spirit tells Peter, there's some Gentiles downstairs, go with them. And he does. He goes to a centurion, worse yet. This guy's in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers. He's like a boss of the evil ones. Well, actually though, he's, he's God-fearer. He loves the Lord. And he says, the Holy Spirit told me to summon you. Preach to us, would you? And Peter does. And while Peter is speaking, he doesn't even get to the punchline of his sermon. And the Holy Spirit falls on all of these Gentiles in Cornelius' household. And they're baptized. And the church back in Jerusalem goes crazy. They can't believe it. In and the story goes on from there. Mm -hmm. So, in these instances, uh, uh, what we can see is that the Holy Spirit unites unites, brings us all together as one in Christ. Wow. Yes, that's a powerful work. I mean, go back to Genesis. There's, there's one guy from one family. And you're right, we, we've divided. And in the Old Testament, we see the Jews very much. Mm. Gentiles, mm. Samaritans. The Holy Spirit comes and fills all of these people, doing exactly what God said he would do in Genesis 12. Creating one redeemed people for himself. Oh yeah, and by the way, back in John 14 through 17, Jesus prays to the Father that you would make them one, even as we are one. And as Heather says, the Holy Spirit does that work among us. It's just beautiful. Look at one last passage about the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. And there are many others, by the way. I'd encourage you to spend some time looking for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. It's, it's really a wonderful exercise. And I wish we had many more hours to do it. It took about four hours in my seminary class on theology. Um, but the Holy Spirit shows up. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, Concerning spiritual gifts, my brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. So these are gifts of the Spirit. When you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So we think about gifts of the Spirit, and you know, we get all excited about tongues and whatever else. What's the first and most important gift of the Spirit? Yes, absolutely, both of you. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our hearts and our minds so that we can believe, so that we can be saved, so that we can glorify the Father, so that we can love the Son. We also learn, Paul says, that there are varieties of gifts, but one Spirit, one Lord. When we hear this, by the way, Shema, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God is one. Paul still very much believes there's one God. But he recognizes that that one God is Lord and Jesus and Spirit. And that they work together, giving gifts we see here of all different sorts. And the gifts are given for a purpose. And it's not 
to make us look cool, and it's not to give us a following. Gifts are given for one reason only, to build up the body. Which goes back to what Heather said, unity. Building up the body in unity under one Father and one Son in one Spirit. There's so much more. Uh, next week, we're going to change gears from this sort of sequential go through the Bible in order approach. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit from a more systematic perspective. Um, one thing you might want to do, uh, take a look at Romans 7 and Romans 8 together. Uh, they need to be taken together as you see this important text where Paul talks about the working of the Spirit. So uh, at that, we bring our work this morning to a close. Um, let's just go ahead and pray and we will uh, go to worship. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, our loving Savior, Holy Spirit, we just want to praise you and thank you. We thank you for the gift of our salvation. We thank you that you have unified us into one body, worshiping our one God. We pray that you would provide for us today, that you would guide us today, and that you'd use us today for your service. In Jesus' name, amen.